ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ την Οργανωτική Επιτροπή για την πρόσκληση να προεδρεύσουμε σε αυτή την διάλεξη ε, για ένα θέμα το οποίο μάλλον μας ακούγεται εντελώς καινούριο. Θα προσφωνήσω τον ομιλητή στα αγγλικά. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite to the podium uh, Professor Line Weaver. He will talk to us about a subject that we have uh, not really heard very much of. It's probably a new uh, approach, a new model uh, in, uh, in seeing how cancer develops and maybe it gives us also a new insight uh, on, uh, on the ways to treat, a new ways to treat cancer. Uh, Professor Lineweaver is not a, a medical doctor, he is an astrobiologist, and I'm wondering how we can combine astrobiology and uh, medical oncology. We are looking forward to hear your new theory. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for inviting me here. I was hoping to walk around here. Can you hear me in the back if I don't use the microphone? Okay, good. Oh, you need to Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So one question you might have is, how is it that an astrobiologist or an astrophysicist is talking to a people who are interested in cancer? And uh, so how did I get from this picture of the universe to this? And one short answer to that question is astrobiology. Now, we astrobiologists, we combine astronomy and biology, and basically we're trying to answer the question, are we alone? And one way to answer that question is, well, how did we get here? Now, what that question implies is a knowledge of the, uh, an understanding of how life started on this planet and how it has evolved over the past approximately four billion years. So when I talk about evolution in this talk, I'm talking about evolution over four billion years, not four decades or the type of time scale that you're used to talking about when you talk about clonal evolution of cancer inside of a person's body before they die. So here's a, one lesson in the four billion year evolution of life, and that is recently we are able to make phylogenetic trees of all life on Earth with the caveat that we're excluding viruses. Um, so this tree does not include viruses, but it includes bacteria here, a new type of prokaryote that was uh, discovered by Carl Woese about 20 years ago, and then eukaryotes. So there's a we've, this is a temperature map, but right here in this green are, are uh, all multicellular life forms. And let's look at that more carefully, blow that up, and we have, we can illustrate that with a Charles Darwin is representing all animals, homo, plants, a zea, the corn, and here's a fungus, Coprinus representing all fungus. So that's the tiny, tiny part of the tree of life that includes multicellular life forms. So let's look at that again. Here's that green area. And between here and here, between the red arrow and the green arrow, is about a billion years of animal evolution. And that's since we're animals, let's have a look more carefully at that billion year time scale. So here is a tree, here we are here. We have a common ancestor with kangaroos, marsupials, about 160 million years ago, with monotremes, about 180, with chickens and birds and other reptiles, 310, frogs, etc. So we have a, these are uh, branches of the tree of life that we have common ancestors with at approximately these dates. And you can see we, they, there's quadrupeds here and a fish and then starfish and insects, etc. And, uh, these are our relatives, and to understand what a human being is, we should try to understand what went on here among all our ancestors, and we use what we have today as proxies for what was here and here and here and here and here. So one billion years of animal evolution. Now, another way to look at that is a phylogenetic tree. Here we have... Uh, Apisticons. Now, apisticons is a fancy word you might not have heard of. It simply means animals and fungi. And here, animals and fungi diverged from each other about 1.3 billion years ago. Here are all the animals, sometimes known as metazoa. Um, now, one thing that's important for cancer is that cancer is a, a disease of undifferentiated, de-differentiation of cells. Now, 
to, in order to de-differentiate, you have to have differentiated. And all of us started out as one cell, and then that divided, divided, divided. And as it divided and turned into about 50 trillion cells of the bodies that we now have, some of those cells differentiated. They became cheeks, others became thigh bones, others became eyeballs. That differentiation process happens during embryogenesis. And uh, we would like to look at that tree of life that I showed you and ask, how many types of, how many types of uh, cells are there in this and this and this and this and this? And when you do a very crude analysis, you get something that looks like, oops, going the wrong way. You, when you do a crude analysis of the number of cell types in an organism, you get something like this. Here's the cell type number, and here, millions of years before present, I, I suspect that birds and humans and, uh, have the same number of cell types. Uh, this is a little bit biased because people who study humans uh, say, oh, this is a separate type of cell type, this is a separate type. But uh, the essential idea is that life started out without cell differentiation, and then cell differentiation evolved. And it evolved on a time scale of 600 or 700 million years. So all of the things that are undone when cancer de-differentiates evolved positively as an ad adaptation for about 700 million years ago. I should mention, if you have any questions during this talk, just call out and, uh, and I will try to answer it. Uh, so here's one billion years of animal evolution. Now let's look at, carefully at this region here, about from 700, say, to about 1.8 million years, because this is the region where we get this evolution of multicellularity. And again, this is an important point because that's what goes wrong in cancer. Cancer cells do not know which part of the body they are from. So when you look carefully at, let's say, 0.7 billion years to about 1.8, you have basically unicellular things becoming colonial things and then becoming multicellular. And as an example of how weird this is, let's have a look at Dictostillum. This is a type of amoeba, and I have a little movie to play of Dictostillum. Now, these are, and I put it to some music. These are all single-celled Dictostillum, and they're looking around and they've been stressed. Food has been removed and they're all starving to death. And when Dictostillum starves to death, you will see that they will start to aggregate together, form a large single body, crawl over here together, and then form a stalk, and then will produce spores. And that's what's going on here. You see they're aggregating here. They say, hey, I'm starving, let's do something. So essentially, they're becoming, in real time, a multicellular body. Oops. Oops. I stopped it or something. I was trying to turn up the sound. Oops, the F9 stops it. How do I turn up the sound? Oh, it's control F9. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there it is crawling away. It's become a multicellular thing. Crawling away, it forms a stalk right here, comes out of the focus of the image, and then only the the cells at the top of that stalk are the ones that produce the spores. The ones that form the stalk have given up their reproductive ability. That shows again the origin of the difference between germ cells, which are in your ovaries and your sperm, and your body, which is your brain and your, and your stomach and your guts and things. So that distinction is something that evolved about 1.8 billion years or so, and it's an important one. So, so there we have, so what we watch is Dictostillum somewhere in between this area of unicellular to multicellular. Now, nothing in cancer biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and so I showed you a few things about the evolution of multicellularity. From a point of view of a, an astrophysicist on the outside looking at cancer, looking at oncobiology, on, well, not, well, looking at you cancer people, 
It looks like you're playing a game of anti-mitotic whack-a-mole. You get something, oh, here's a mechanism, you whack it there, say, take a picture of it and see, hey, see how it's gone away, and then remission somewhere else it comes. And that's because of the redundancy of the mechanisms that cells have to reproduce, essentially. Another more sophisticated way of looking at that is your traffic police, and you say, oh, there's a way to get from here to here. I'll block this road, and then whoop, the cars go the other way. Oh, I'll block this way, and the cars go the other way. And uh, the important part is figuring out how many different ways there are of going. And one of the theories, I'll, well, the theory that I'll be talking about, the atavistic model, tries to organize these routes in the order in which they evolved. So one paper we wrote a few years ago Cancer tumors as metazoa, tapping genes of ancient ancestors. So I just wanted to read the abstract. The genes of cellular cooperation that evolved with multicellularity about a billion years ago are the same genes that malfunction to cause cancer. We hypothesize that cancer is an atavistic condition, there's atavistic in Greek, that occurs when genetic or epigenetic malfunction unlocks an ancient toolkit of pre-existing adaptations. That's an important word, pre-existing. And that means that cancer has no new abilities. All of these rogue cells and renegade cells, they are, have these mutations. They're not going anywhere in mutation space. They are reverting to adaptations that have already exist in the genome that have been suppressed in order to become a multicellular organism. There's a history to all this, in other words. Um, Reestablishing the dominance of an earlier layer of genes that controlled loose-knit colonies of only partially differentiated cells similar to tumors. The existence of such a toolkit implies that the progress of the neoplasm in the host organism differs distinctively from normal Darwinian evolution in which you have an open-ended evolution similar to the antibiotic evolution of uh, well, bacteria become resistant to antibiotics in hospitals, but there you have generation after generation after generation. It's very open-ended. What I'm suggesting is that when cancers evolve, it's not open-ended at all. It's more like a poet sitting on top of a bunch of poems that have already been written billions of years ago, and they say, oh, what can you, how do you deal with this situation? You reach in and pull out a poem that already has evolved because the evolution of adaptive features can't be done in 10 years or 20 years, as is implied by almost every speaker I've heard, but is a result of millions and millions of years of evolution that is then suppressed, and what is easy is to take off that suppression, and then presto, changeo, the cancer cells can outcompete the normal cells of your body, not because they've arrived at some wonderful adaptive thing, but because they've uncovered something that was already there, uncovering some pre-adapted uh, Functionality is much, much easier than trying to invent it yourself from open mutation. Okay, so atavism, I thought I'd make a, just a short explanation of the difference between atavisms here and vestigial features. So atavisms are like supernumerary nipples right here, for example, or tails here, webbing between toes, extra toes on horses, hind legs of snakes, and hind fins of dolphin. If you're not a dolphin expert, you may not realize that dolphins usually do not have fins there, but occasionally they appear. Now vestigial features, so these are kind of abnormal, vestigial features are cetacean pelvic bones. Right here, for example, you look at, go to a museum and you will see whales that have pelvic girdles here that are atrophied, but that's normal. An appendix is normal, wisdom teeth are normal, and our tails are normal. They're atrophied examples, but they're normal. These are not normal. These have to do with genetic mutations. So uh, as a local uh, thing here, these are horses with extra legs. You know, horses used to have five fingers, and then they had turned into three. In embryogenesis, horses have three, but then the two on the sides do not evolve, and that's why you end up with one. And so uh, there's a myth or a, a story that this, the horse of Alexander the Great had was such a horse, and I went looking at the statue of Bucephalus that they have here, and I wasn't able to see any third toe, so maybe it's wrong, or maybe the sculptor didn't know about this wonderful story. Anyway, uh, so let's look at the development of a whale. So you have a fertilized egg, and you have 
this is the differentiation pathways. You know, there are about, oh, maybe 200 different cell types, but here I'm just making about 10. In, as an embryo, the whale has a leg. It's starting to develop a leg. But then there's, there has evolved a suppressor of leg growth that then stops that, and then you, don't, then you only get this. But occasionally something goes wrong with that suppressor, and then back comes the leg. And that's what you have these legs in cetaceans. That's the analogy for what we think cancer is. So the development of a whale is a well-regulated but continuous cascade of maturing cells. So these little dots here are to represent not stem cells, but uh, germ cells that then produce the differentiation. All over your body, you have cells that are less differentiated, which then can differentiate. For example, in wound healing, if you cut yourself here, your, your skin has to then regenerate differentiated cells from less differentiated cells. That's what these little black dots are representing. Now, one thing I wanted to mention also is the Hayflick limit. You know, your cells, I, I mentioned something like 100 trillion cells in your body, and you might ask yourself the question, how did these cells know when to stop growing? They double and double and double and double, and then they have to stop. And that stopping is called the Hayflick limit. And uh, so you have about 44 generations of cells. If you double and double and double, 2 to the 44th is about the number of cells in your body. But then it has to stop. And stopping is something that had to evolve. And when it doesn't stop, something goes wrong with that stopping, that's when you get cancer, unregulated cell proliferation. Now, let's compare that with the development of a cancer. So here we have a fertilized egg, so we have an organism here. Let's say this is a human being, and there are like 10 types of cells, just for, just for example. Now, here we have maturation of normal cells, but then we have some type of tumor suppressor, just like the suppressor that suppressed you know, there was a suppressor of the leg, and then something went wrong, and then the leg appeared in a, in a whale. Well, here we have a suppressor of uh, maturation or differentiation, and then you get cells that are only as differentiated as we are up here, not down here. So this is like mesenchymal stem cells, dermal fibroblasts. These are more and more uh, differentiated. Also, you can have maturation blocks, for example, in leukemia, where you have, here's a, a, a pluripotent stem cell that divides and divides and differentiates. And then when you have something wrong with the regulation of this differentiation, then you get a whole bunch of immature cells, which just screw up the thing because you don't need immature cells. Your body needs mature cells. And that's called leukemia. So the development of cancer, uh, you have a well-regulated but continuous cascade of maturing cells. That's the normal process. And when something goes wrong with that, then you have cancer. So in your body, many cells are terminally differentiated by some, uh, by some develop mature to replace the old cells. So the blood, the linings of your gastrointestinal tract, your dermal cells. Mitosis is an ongoing thing that we need. That's why there's so many toxic side effects of anti-mitotic drugs. And so that's why it's not such a great idea to, to put anti-mitotic agents into your body because that makes your hair fall out, that makes your gastrointestinal tract unable to slough off the, the lining that it needs to do to survive, and any other places where you need growth as part of your ongoing maintenance of your body. So here's the paper we wrote a couple of years ago targeting, so how can this, if this theory is correct, how can it be used therapeutically? What's the sense of having this grand theory of cancer if you can't apply it to therapy? And that's what we're all interested in. So we wrote a paper about how it could be applied to therapy. Now, here's one way. So what this theory suggests is that if you have a bunch of abilities that cells can do, there is an order to which those abilities evolved. Now, in blue here are the earliest evolved capabilities common to LUCA. LUCA means last universal common ancestor of all life on Earth. So these are the abilities that all cells have. We share them with fish, we share them with coral, we share them with amoebas, we share them with all the bacteria. These are the earliest abilities that we share. We have 20,000 genes. Some of those genes are very, very ancient. These are the ones that are, enable these capabilities. And then there are less ancient ones that enable this, 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 and this. And then these are the most recent capabilities that our cells have. So anything you can think of, cell cycle or DNA repair, is a complicated process that has an order 
in which it evolved. And what we're suggesting is that when you figure out that order, you can then predict the earliest ones are cancer cells, the capabilities of cancer cells. The later ones are the abilities that cancer loses. So cancer is an atavistic reversion to earlier capabilities, and it loses the newer capabilities. If that's the case, then that provides all types of leverages that, le that can be used therapeutically. And I'll talk about one example here. Okay, one example was the immu immune system that we just heard. Now, crudely speaking, the immune system can be divided into the innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity we know evolved, oh, in the last five or 600 million years, and innate is much older. We know this because adaptive immunity, that's the thing that vaccines rely on, T cells, uh, can, is, you can do vaccination here, but you can't vaccinate here. So there's a difference, Just a, it's a crude difference, it really should be continuous, but basically we can talk about adaptive and innate. What, this, what our theory claims is that cancer cells lose the adaptive immune system and they rely only on this. What that means is that if you can provide an environment, let's say we have a normal cell and a cancer cell, this theory says normal cells have adaptive and innate immunity, cancer cells only have innate. So we know that the adaptive immunity works against some kind, it can be vaccinated, therefore cancer cells cannot be vaccinated against a certain a pathogen. So what you do is you give the body a pathogen, kind of like Coley did, that is protect, normal cells can protect themselves because they have an act, they've been vaccinated, for example. They have an adaptive immune system that works. Cancer cells do not. That, I think, is the mechanism behind things like Coley, but it can be much done much better uh, because what Coley did was, uh, I, people stopped doing it because it was too dangerous to get the dosage right because essentially you were putting pathogens into the body and kind of arbit semi-arbitrarily attacking the body, and if you didn't get the dosage just right, you essentially gave a disease to the person who, who died. So this, has to, this is a leverage arm that can be used, but you have to be careful what you're doing here. That's why you have to immunize or vaccinate normal cells so they're really ready for that pathogen, which you then give to the body, and which cancer cells cannot defend themselves from. Not just is innate and adaptive immunity, but for anything. For example, for the past few years, I've been trying to figure out the order in which the cells, the, the stop points, the start points, the checkpoints of the cell cycle evolve. Now we talk about the cell cycle, but in biology, there's no such thing as the anything. It's something that has evolved, you know, this piece evolved, then this piece, then this piece, then this piece, then this piece. So the atavistic model says, if you can look at the cell cycle, figure out which are the pieces that evolved recently, which are the pieces that are more ancient, the atavistic model predicts that cancer will be only relying on the ancient ones, presumably getting around all the checkpoints that have evolved more recently. And so you have to provide an environment in which only, only if you have the, the newest stuff can you then proceed. That's the idea. Another example is, now, if you, have a, if you put toxic things into a cell, it pushes them out of the cell using what are called ATP binding cassettes, or ABC transporter superfamily, and this is a phylogenetic tree of that superfamily. Some of these lines are short, and some of them are long. The ones that are short, for example, this one, is closer to the origin, and therefore you could call it ancient. These longer ones are more recently evolved. So here we have a system of whole, you can see how complicated it is. The prediction is that Cancer cells loses the longer ones and relies on the shorter ones. And when you plot them on this same type of plot, you can see that the, the cancer uses these, there are ones in dark, and these doesn't use these as much. There's about a two sigma signal of cancer relying on older things and not newer things. Now, one way to understand this model is, when you have phylogeny four billion years ago, you have the human lineage, and then it evolves. On, there's this idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, and so you have ontogeny as cell sites differentiate, differentiate, differentiate. Cancer seems to be a reversal of this ontogeny to less differentiated stages. So de-differentiation is carcinogenesis recapitulating backwards ontogeny and phylogeny. Uh, 
Now, one paper in 2007 by Gerhardt and Kirshner talked about which the metazoan toolkit of conserved functional components and processes, when did they first arise in evolution? So three billion years ago, you had these types of things. Two billion years ago, you had these. One billion years ago, you had these. And in the recent 500 million years, you have these. So, there, so this whole theory relies on understanding the order in which capabilities evolved. Here are the ones in that, uh, where the regulation of cell proliferation evolved. And so for, I would mention DNA repair, for example. There are about maybe 10, maybe 15 different ways of repairing DNA. And so when you're using radiation of different frequencies or proton beams or uh, carbon ions, you're doing certain types of damage to DNA. And if you can look at the ancient DNA repair mechanisms, look at the new, the newest DNA repair mechanisms, figure out which kinds of repair those new mechanisms are best at, then you produce that type of damage that can only or can preferentially be repaired by the newer DNA repair mechanisms. Then you maximize the difference between the inability of cancer cells to repair what you're doing and the heightened ability of normal cells to repair what you're doing with the radiation. So this theory, notice uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's a, a global theory of cancer. Uh, and I guess cancer is the elephant, and then somebody says, oh, no, it's pancreatic cancer. No, it's uh, colon cancer. They're all different. But in many ways, they are similar, and that's what the hallmarks of cancer papers by Hanahan and Weinberg were about in 2001 and 2011, trying to, uh, of all these details, what are the common features of cancer? And that's what I'm addressing here, the common features of cancer. So the atavistic model is a whole elephant model. So just to repeat what the therapeutic implications are, Current therapeutic treatments predominantly target what cancer cells and all cells have deeply embedded in their genomes, cellular proliferation. It may seem rational to treat a proliferative disease with anti-proliferative drugs. However, after 4 billion years of evolution, the first 3 billion of which were largely unregulated proliferation of unicellular organisms, cellular proliferation may be the most protected, least vulnerable, most redundant and most entrenched capability that any cell has. The redundant and robust supports for cellular proliferation are two billion years older than the many layers of recent differentiation and regulation that evolved with multicellular eukaryotes. So here are these hallmarks of cancer. And notice they have inhibitors, inhibitors, inhibitors. And these are trying to inhibit mitosis, but as I said, if Cellular proliferation, unregulated cellular proliferation, is that old. It's also that redundant. And essentially, you're, you have a knight in shining armor, and you keep sticking the knight at the thickest part of its armor. And the, uh, the question is, how, wait, let's not attack can cancer at its strengths. Let's find its weaknesses. According to this atavistic model, the weaknesses of cancer are its inability to have the capabilities that have most recently evolved. And that gives, no matter what field of cancer you're in, you can ask the question, what is the order in which the things I'm dealing with evolved? Let's assume the atavistic model is correct. The older ones are going to be functional in cancer. The newest ones are not. Therefore, you have a distinguishing feature between normal cells and cancer cells that can be taken advantage of. A simple analogy is, uh, let's suppose a normal cell is like a castle with a moat. The moat is the more recently evolved thing. The older castle is old and protected. Now, how would you, if you had a bunch of castles with moats and then a bunch of castles alone, how would you attack them to only attack these guys? Well, the answer is you get a bunch of ferocious warriors who can't swim. And then you attack and the normal cells are protected because it has this recently evolved moat, which you have created, which, and you created at an attack mechanism that you can't get over this moat because your warriors can't swim. That's, the, that's essentially what the, the vaccination, the innate versus adaptive immunity. Here is innate immunity present in both. Here is adaptive immunity. You attack with something that can be protected by the adaptive immunity and that doesn't have it. 
Okay, another example are these, uh, I think I showed this a little bit. So, so when you're getting, we have, a cell has a way to get chemicals out of itself. Those ways are called ABC, protein, ATP binding cassettes or transporter superfamily. We know the, evol the, the difference between the newly evolved ones and the older ones. Let's assume that the older ones are in cancer, the newer ones are not. Therefore, you develop a chemical. Now, any time there's a new, any time there is a new evolution, that thing has a peculiarity to it, a certain specificity. And what you try to do is get a drug which is efficiently transported by a newly evolved ABC protein, the longer ones here. And then the cancer cells, which don't have access to the new things, cannot efficiently push that out of the cell. So evidence for this atavistic model are the following. They're, they're much longer lists, but here's a few. Simultaneous loss of regulated growth and differentiation. They evolve together in stages. They are lost together in stages. Uh, these, the 2000 and 2011 Hannah and Weinberg papers are all normal functions. In other words, the hallmarks of cancer are normal abilities of the cell. And those normal abilities evolved over millions of years, not over decades. And uh, I could go on and on and on. The Warburg effect, the preference for hypoxia, the E to N cadherin switching. So when you became a multicellular organism, your cells had to learn how to adhere to each other. Those adherence mechanisms also, again, there's an order to which they evolved. They have uh, N evolved, N cadherins evolved before the E ones did. So therefore, cancer cells are not held together by E, but rather by N. So all of these things, no matter what your field of oncology you're in, you can use this theory to help distinguish uh, how you're going to attack cancer, preferentially over normal cells. Now, recently, about a month ago, some very good evidence for this atavistic model came out, and I just wanted to show you this, altered interactions between unicellular and multicellular genes. Have a look at this plot here, for example. This is the difference in phylostratum proportion. Now here are the old unicellular genes, and here are the multicellular genes, and these are expressions in cancer. You can see that the old genes are overexpressed com compared to normal in cancer, and these genes are underexpressed. So that's, uh, that suggests, that, that's evidence for this model. Also, as cancer progresses, it, the genes that are active become older and older and older. The cells become more de-differentiated, they come, become more and more similar, and that is just what's seen here in the ages of the genes that are active in cancer cells as cancer progresses through stages. Now, here's some objections that I've heard to this model. They say, oh, it's an imaginative metaphor. The cancer literature is so large that one can probably find lots of evidence to support any crazy idea. There is no evidence to believe that the ability to develop blood vessels is an ancient feature of animals, is what one person said. I disagree with that. This is the idea of angiogenesis. You know, c uh, cancer can put out some hormones to make the vascular system vascularize around it to get all that blood. And uh, so in order to address this issue, you say, okay, what are the different mechanisms involved in angiogenesis? Which ones evolved early? Which ones evolved later? Our hypothesis is that the earliest evolved aspects of angiogenesis are present and active in cancer, and the later evolved ones are not. Uh, ontogeny does not recapitulate phylogeny. They said, it's all terminal addition. Now, P.Z. Myers said, what is a bunch of astrophysicists telling us biologists about this? You guys are crazy. You guys are arrogant. You shouldn't do that. So you can read a very disdainful review of this idea by P.Z. Myers if you're interested. Now, um, atavistic legs and nipples are 30 to 50 million years old, not a billion years old. So I'm using time scales of a billion years. The examples I gave of atavisms are 30 to 50 million years. And uh, so what we're talking about are physiological atavisms that have deeper roots than the more obvious morphological atavisms. Uh, and, uh, well, a few other things. But the idea I just wanted to leave you with is that cancer is a, or the genome is a palimpsest and the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, UV radiation, chemical toxins, and all kinds of things in the environment that are carcinogenic, 
they essentially are destroying, dysregulating the superficial layers that are most recently evolved and uncovering or derepressing the ancient layers. And that's what cancer is, an atavistic reversion to those ancient layers because of the dysregulation of the more recent layers. You can think of it as a palimpsest or an onion or a uh, archaeological dig, if you'd like. All, anything in which there's a chronological separation where the deeper things are more fundamental, hard to get at, and the more recent things are additions. You can also think of it as a, as a, as a corporation. You know, when you have, you're a summer intern, you're the most recently hired, but you're also the first one that's going to get fired. And uh, also, I, I, I just I was reading about a palimpsest, and I heard that there's an Archimedes palimpsest, and this is it, right here. And if you take away the recent stuff, you get Archimedes here, the method and the stomachion. Uh, and here's that book. And with that, I will close. Uh, other than this little cartoon, and now I'd like to tell you. To, and now I'd like each of you to tell me what you would have liked to be when you grew up, had your predecessors not doomed you to be somatic cells. That's a, the division between uh, somatic cells and germ cells that happened about two billion years ago. So thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, it was excellent uh, talk, a new theory. I think we must digest all the things we have presented now. I'm sure there are, much, there are, there are questions from the floor. If I understood correctly, at least, you describe cancer as a prehistoric disease or prehistoric monster or something like this? Did I understand no, no, correct? No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I think that uh, I would say that cancer is a result of abilities which were highly functional a billion years ago before we became multicellular creatures. And then to become multicellular creatures, we had to control all of these things in a rec like the Hayflick limit, or we had to control cell proliferation, something that you don't need to do if you're a bacteria or a single cell critter. Since we have all these things that evolve to control, if something goes wrong with those controls, then we revert. I wouldn't call that an ancient disease. I would say that it makes prediction, predictions that the abilities of cancer will exclusively be dominated, well, will be dominated by ancient genes rather than new genes. So I wouldn't call it an ancient disease. I would call it a, an atavistic one. That's why we use that term. I mean, cancer is probably as old as multicellularity because as soon as you start to evolve multicellularity, of course, you, that comes with deregulation of the regulation that is evolving. So not just dinosaurs, but this is, we're talking about the origin of multicellularity. That's why oncologists are not aware of this because oncologists do not study four billion years of evolution of life. They don't know anything about the origin of multicellularity, but cancer is, is a disease of multicellular organisms, so it, it's very important to understand how multicellularity evolved because that's what's going wrong. Questions from the audience? Uh, yes, please.
20-year history, that cell has already experienced all kinds of attacks that you can imagine, and the ones that live had to have evolved redundant pathways to get around those problems. That, that means, that's why you don't attack the strength of cancer. I can say it over and over again, but I would say 98% of the cancer community is involved in antimycotics. What I've just told you is mitosis is 4 billion, not 4 billion, uh, well, cell fusion, cell fission is older. Mitosis is something associated with eukaryotic cells. But the division of cells is as old as life itself. When you start, try to stop that dividing, that's, all, that's like getting that armor tight and just poking them in the thickest place of the armor. What you have to figure out is what is the weakness. That's why I gave those examples of the uh, innate versus adaptive immunity, right? Phylostratigraphy is a way to date the origin of genes. So you say, okay, here's a gene that we share with chimpanzees, uh, but we only share them with chimpanzees. We don't share them with, uh, let's say, gorillas, orangutans, or monkeys. So that's a new gene. But here's another gene. Oh, we share that with not only corals and sponges, but we also share it with bacteria. Then you say, oh, that's an old one. And using systematically going through the phylogenetic tree of life, you can assign an age approximately. It's, really, it's fraught with difficulty, but a, you can get approximate ages at which genes evolve, and then protein products evolve. You said that it's hard to do, but the, this paper by Trigos et al. came out last month in PNAS, j did just that. It had these genes that had given ages, and then they said, let's look at the expression it, well, it's actually it was transcriptome analysis of cancer cells versus normal cells for different types of cancers. I think they were all solid cancers, however. And they said, oh, look at these. These are overexpressed in cancer cells compared to normal. Ah, those were all the old genes. The younger genes were underexpressed. And so that's, so far, that's the best evidence we have supporting this model. Maybe we yes. can leave yes. the discussion for the end. Outside. Yes. Yes. Well, it does both, right? The individual cells are part of the organism, so it, it protects, it does both. Yes. Yes, well, well, the immune system. I Maybe. Let's, give, let's give space for other questions, please. Okay. We'll talk later. I'm Charlie. Okay. What's your name? <laughs> Maybe one more Dr. Bukovina's one question. Uh, thank you very much for your provocative um, uh, talk. Uh, since you mentioned the uh, DNA repair system, uh, mm -hmm. If we use DNA uh, repair inhibitors, like PARP inhibitors, the cancer cell restores its initial way to be a normal cell and then escapes uh, the pressure by DNA uh, inhibitors. Uh, how do you explain this well, uh, in terms of your theory? All right, so the first thing you have to do is, it, this is a good example of radiation therapy, right? Because you're in, you're making damage to DNA, and you have the ability to damage DNA in different ways. Let's say there are 10 different ways to damage DNA. You know, single breaks, double breaks, uh, you can methylate things, you can, you can do all kinds of damage. Um, and then there are, let's say, 10 different ways for the cell to repair itself, to repair the DNA. Those 10, there was first this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. The atavistic theory says, 
in that if you can get the order of DNA repair mechanisms, find the one that's most recent, and then we assume, the model says, that that recent repair mechanism is not functional in cancer cells anymore. Did normal cells have it? Cancer cells do not. So cancer cells have nine of the 10. Normal cells have 10 of the 10. That last one to evolve has some specificity about it. It's really good at repairing this type of damage and not the other types. So what you do is then say, I'm going to make radiation therapy to make the exact type, or as closely as I can, the exact type of DNA damage that that most recently evolved DNA repair mechanism knows how to do really well. That will give you the maximum lever arm between the time of repair of the DNA between normal cells and the cancer cells. I don't know if I answered your question. Did I answer your question? You're happy with that? Okay. Okay. Anybody unhappy? <laughs> One more question. Last question. Excuse me, could you speak a little louder, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I was saying uh, thank you for your beautiful talk. I am a biologist, and it's the first time that uh, I see this perspective in cancer. So if I understood well, uh, the atavistic model suggests that uh, cancer is a type of inertia of life against evolution. Uh, basically, uh, cancer cells are uh, reminiscent of uh, old life, and uh, probably we need old tools to fight it. So, uh, in this context, uh, uh, maybe it uh, would be best to uh, compare our genome with um, uh, the genome of uh, archaea or uh, bacteria to find uh, similar genes in order to, uh, as you said before with uh, Dr. Moschelos, uh, to find uh, the similarities with uh, not only uh, the, physiolo the physiological cells and the cancer cells, but uh, similarities between our ancestors. So maybe we could also check on the DNA fossils, on this so-called uh, junk DNA that uh, there is no use of. Uh, what is your position on that? Uh, well, two things. One is that in terms of the 20,000 genes that we know about in humans, what you suggested is what I tried to describe earlier in what's called phylostratigraphy dating of genes. So we can say these 1,000 genes are recent, these 1,000 genes are here, these 1,000 genes are here. And so we already have made the comparisons with archaea and bacteria because the, the full genome sequence banks are just exponentially increasing, so we're getting more and more species, and that enables us to make pretty or very good estimates of these ages. As to your comment that it's an old disease, therefore we should attack it with old uh, tools, that I disagree with. And the reason is, let me give you another example. Suppose there are two people. One person speaks ancient Greek, and this person also speaks modern Greek. We have this person here who has forgotten modern Greek and only speaks ancient Greek. So this is the cancer cell, the cancer person, and this is the, the normal person. Now, if you wanted to differentiate between these two people and make this person suffer, you give them all kinds of instructions and hoops to jump over that in modern Greek. This cancer person doesn't understand modern Greek, this, this newly evolved thing. It only understands the ancient Greek. And so that would be, so what you have to do is put, uh, create an environment in which this modern Greek speaking person can do well and you're testing that. If you try to attack ancient Greek, you're attacking both this person and this person and it's highly redundant. It's already been attacked so many times that it, it's just incredibly redundant. There's the multiple pathways. It's the whack-a-mole idea. Uh, and so I, I don't think it's old tools that we need, but rather a recognition of this difference, a recognition of the order in which genes and abilities evolve, and then creating environments in which this modern speaking Greek normal cell can outcompete this ancient Greek only speaking person. Okay. I'm sure there are many more questions. Uh, we'll have time at, uh, at the break to discuss. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lionworth Weaver. <laughs>